Welcome to another show of Celebrate Life. Actually, today is the second anniversary of the beginning of this show, so we're uh, happy to be doing this for two years now. My name is Gary DeCarlis, and I'll be your host for today. Um, over the years, I've read too many obituaries that left me pondering, why did I, I not have a chance to meet this person while they were alive? The goal of this show is to celebrate people's lives while they're very much part of our community. Um, some people you'll recognize, other people you may not, but I can tell you this, everyone has a story to tell. If you would like to be interviewed on the show, please get in touch with me at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com. Or if you have a question for our guest, who is Joey Donovan today, please again, send me an email at celebratelife0747 at gmail.com and I'll get it over to Joey. So with that, I'd like to welcome Joey Donovan. Great to have you on the show today, Joey. Thanks, Gary. It was a struggle to get here, but I'm very happy yes, to be was, here. But we made it. Yes. <laughs> Perseverance. So, um, well, we're here to celebrate your life today. So let's um, maybe we can start by having you tell us where it all began. Well, I was um, actually a native Burlingtonian, and there are, as the older I get, the fewer I think we are. Um, and um, I was born at the De Osborne Hospital. And um, then my parents took me home to a, uh, our first home, which was on Stanford Road in the new North End. And um, that was a, a wonderful neighborhood at the time because Oakland Terrace and other streets were being developed. So there was always an opportunity to have, see some action and some great machinery and fellows telling you to get out of the way. And, um, and uh, but always looking forward to more kids moving in. And um, so we, we had a wonderful life out there in the New North End. Mm. And um, I went for one year to uh, kindergarten at the old Thayer School. It's now, a, I think it's a drugstore. It's, uh, it, uh, yeah, it, I think it, it's it a, looks like, like a, many it looks like H.O. Wheeler and the old Champlain School yeah and uh, I, I often uh, I can't believe that my parents I was in the afternoon session so I walked all the way up Stanford Road and all down North Avenue to their school by myself wow but I think that's what happened those days yes uh, you know that people just very didn't different. know anything about evil or anything like that so that's right you just did what you had to do wow but it was it was a it was a great neighborhood, and uh, as I said, lots of kids to play with, and um, a lot of um, cellar holes to play in, and uh, get the construction people a little bit nervous. <laughs> so, um, and then you moved. Yes, I think um, my father used to come home for lunch every day, and his. He was a lawyer and he, his office was at 200 Main Street. Mm -hmm. And I think at some point he decided it just was too far to come home for lunch. So instead we had to all move in town to make it easier for him <clears throat> to come home for lunch. Interesting. And, and we all went home. My brothers who were at Cathedral Grammar School, I was at Mount St. Mary's. Everybody came home for lunch. And my Isn't mother, so? God bless her, used to, we have almost like a dinner for lunch. And, wow. uh, you know, it, we'd have roast chicken at night and have pot roast or something for lunch. Wow. And I, I often wonder about how she ever got through those days because it was, they were long days full wow. of a lot of things to do. Wow. A, a wonderful home environment, it sounds like, Joey. It was. It was, it was a terrific environment. And I think um, I, one, one thing that I don't think that I wrote in, my, in some of my sp stories to you was, they, the poor farm used to be out on the um, end of Ethan Allen. You, know, you go to the Ethan Allen Park. I think that's the Ethan Allen Highway. Wait, yeah. It was way at the end of that. Hmm. And I can remember um, my mother going out to meet this man who used to walk by. And she always said, you'd be very respectful for him because he's living at the poor farm. Interesting. And uh, we always, we, uh, my brothers and sisters and I always thought that um, people in need had marked a tree or something in front of our house, wherever we lived, because they always found my mother and she huh. was always so generous with her wow. time and food and money. So uh, 
uh, we always had some interesting people who uh, we learned that we were quite fortunate. Wow. To know them. So Joey, is the is the park Letty Park named after your dad? It is, and um, it, it just all sort of happened um, uh, very quickly. The city had just bought that land from I think a company called Karenko or something like that. And so they were developing it into a park. And um, my father died very suddenly in January of 72. And um, it was a shock mm. to all of us. And certainly to um, you know friends and neighbors and people in Burlington. And he had served a long time back in the, uh, I think the early 30s and 40s on the park commission in Burlington. Mm. And he, he just loved, he was a farm boy from Underhill, so he loved country settings. He loved the environment. He was really mm. quite an environmentalist too back before it was known that we all should be. And mm. um, so he, it was just wonderful that um, all of a sudden the commission decided to name the park for him because they were just developing it. Wow, that's and, amazing. Um, my mother used to buy um, uh, birthday cakes for my children from the Carvel ice cream cake thing in, in the shopping center. And I remember I was going to pick up a cake one day and this very nice woman who was working the counter said, you know, she had my mother's name, Mrs. Letty. And she said, oh my gosh, it was so nice of your family to donate all that land. <laughs> and I said, honey, if we owned an inch of it, I'd be living there now. Isn't it? <laughs> but it was quite an honor. And I'm sure my father, uh, is very proud to have that. Absolutely, yeah. that was a nice honor. Yeah. So, as a as a young girl, what what was what were you, when you thought about what do I want to be when I grow up? What what, did, what were some of your thoughts? Well, I think I wanted to be a cowgirl. Okay. <laughs> I was very into Annie Oakley and um, and cowboys as well. I was a great fan of Gene Autry's mm. and. Um, I thought Roy Rogers was trying to take his title of King of the Cowboys. So um, I, I just, I, I, I was taken with them, mm -hmm. the old West and the Cowboys and everything. So I think I probably would have maybe featured yeah. a, 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 a stint as uh, Annie Oakley in something, nice. but I don't think I could ever ride the horse that she did. So. <laughs> but so I, you... I don't think I thought about a career for a long time, Gary. I just, um, yeah. You know, life just sort of evolved in front of you and life was very simple. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, when you moved in town, though, you I, then you changed schools, obviously. You went yes. to... Uh, I went to Mount St. Mary's Academy. Mount St. Mary's, yes, okay. And yeah. um, the Good Sisters allowed boys to come to the school um, through kindergarten through second grade. And then they had to go up somewhere else. They were Oh, interesting. <laughs> so... Um, and uh, I, so I, gra I graduated from eighth grade from Mount St. Mary's. Mm. And at that time, the Rice Memorial High School was being built. And, and so I told my father and mother that I wanted to leave the, the academy. And my father was just really against it because he said, um, he thought that any well-trained woman should be trained by the sisters. and. Um, so I think I threatened to leave home and run away and take the next bus out of town and all those idle threats teenagers make. Uh -huh. And um, to my surprise, he finally said it would be okay. Uh -huh. So um, as at 14 years old, I um, the high school at that time was on uh, Pearl Street in downtown, but they didn't have room for all four grades. So freshmen used to go to Pomeroy School which was an old school that looked again like the architecture mm -hmm. that many schools did. And um, so we were all together at um, Pomeroy as freshmen. And oh, um, so, and we moved to Rice, I think it was second semester of that year. And oh. it was just so glitzy new and beautiful, you know, mm -hmm. it was such a difference. But um, it was um, the Pomeroy, when I was 14, there was a girl's entrance and there was a boy's entrance. Interesting. <laughs> and, um, you never interchanged either. Right. Yep. Um, 
but I can remember it was a, it was difficult for me in that fall. It was 1958, and my father the previous summer had weakened and consent, consented to running for governor. Mm. So I would go in the girls' entrance at Pomeroy. Some of my fellow students, mostly young gentlemen, would wave down to me uh -huh. and welcome me and embarrass me to the absolute. Uh -huh. So it, it was a it was kind of a, a mixed, um, mixed yeah. feeling. And I remember um, Marilyn Fayette, her father was running for United States. State Senator that year. And um, Marilyn and I were in the same class for one of the classes that we had. I, I can't remember which one, but it was an older nun and she was she was very, very nice. But I don't think, I, I, I'm sure that neither Marilyn and I went to school the day after that November election. And but I remember coming into the class and Sister Benigna had written on the board, condolences to the Fayette and Lady oh, 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 oh. So another now, kind of an embarrassment. Oh, brother. Now, uh, your dad and the family's Democrat. Yes. In the 50s, that was almost an impossible task to, well, to win was. an election. Yeah. I, th I think he was a nervous wreck because the recount didn't happen until January. And it happened in the second floor of um, the House committee rooms. Hmm. And so no one knew who was governor of Vermont until oh um, that recount happened. Wow. And it was a it was kind of a, um, a telling story because some of the clerks brought the ballots up to Montpelier for the recount. And some some ballots were destroyed by rats. Oh, some no. Had, you know, moisture on them. And so it was it was kind of a, a lesson to take and say, you know, we must do a little bit better. I mean, uh, oh, yeah, Donald Trump would have loved having. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, um, my. It was that close, Joey. He the in the end result, I think on election night, he was behind by twelve hundred votes. And wow. after the recount, he, he um, lost by seven hundred and nineteen. Whoa, votes. no kidding. Yeah. So it was it was really exciting. And he just thought he he missed a bullet. Yeah. <laughs> Wow. And then, you know, uh, four years later, Phil Hoff became our first elected Democratic governor. Oh, so this was a signal that yeah, things were yeah, changing. Absolutely. Yes. absolutely. Wow. Wow. So, so you grew up in a, a political home where... Very much so. Yeah. yeah. What was that like? Well, you know, I, I don't I don't think we ever had any of the Kennedy-esque table conversations. Um, but, you know, election day was like a holiday at our house. 195 North Prospect Street was off in the Ward 1 Democratic headquarters. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, you, you worked to pull out votes and, and drive people mm -hmm. to the polls. And, yeah. you know, the absent ballot thing was really a sick ballot back then, if, if I remember correctly. Yes, that's right. And yeah. so you really had to promote people to get out, pick them up, bring them home. And I can remember um, doing that for several elections and having so many women say to me, oh, I don't vote, my husband votes for me. Wow. And I remember as a 15, 16 year old kid that there's Jeez. something wrong with this picture. <laughs> wow, that's so it amazing. Was, um, yeah, it was, um, it was a very uh, interesting people <clears throat> and mm -hmm. interesting times, it was good, it was good. Did you run for any office while in high school? Uh, I did not. I don't. No, I don't think I did. Mm -hmm. um, no, I was never a class officer or anything. I don't. No. Yeah. Okay. I'm no, just curious. And I was not a cheerleader either. Uh, okay. <laughs> did you enjoy high school? Was it? I was did. It, I did yeah. enjoy it. I think. Um, I was saying to people last night. I think my problem was. Um, I had my own personal curriculum and it didn't always match with the curriculum that the teacher in the room was trying to um, uh, teach, teach me. I, I, I loved reading, I loved reading history. And, um, and I think that too came from my mother. She always would buy these, there were two different books she would buy. There's the, the landmark book, which was a biography of some great American hero or 
mm -hmm. leader or whatever. And then there was a Catholic version of that. And it told lives of the great saints that we should oh, pattern yes. ourselves. Yes. Out. But um, I think I read all the Bobsy twins and uh, just, you know, I lo yeah. loved reading. It was wonderful. Mm. Mm -hmm. So, so what, what happened after high school? Where, what, what, where, well, I, um, I went to Massachusetts to a um, Catholic college there. It was Merrimack College, which is run by the same priest that run Villanova. Hmm. And um, I, th I think I needed to a uh, change. So I went there for two years and then it, it was it was kind of rural and I decided you know, I didn't want, so I came back to Vermont. And um, I went to see the admissions chair at uh, the University of Vermont where I intended to transfer to. But he told me that he could not take my philosophy or my theology credits because they were Catholic. Oh, geez. And so um, as I started to do the, the math about getting credits, I thought, oh, that, that would add a whole nother semester on, on my uh, college career. And I didn't think my father would approve of that. So I ended up going to see Sister Patrick, who you probably know as Sister Elizabeth Candon right. at Trinity. And she welcomed me and my philosophy and my theology credit. <laughs> so um, I lived at home during that time because I was so fearful of trying to live at Trinity because the sisters were quite strict and they had very strict curfews. And mm -hmm. I thought, oh, I would be setting myself up for trouble because I'd probably get thrown out on my <laughs> ear. And that would be another awful blow to my parents. <laughs> so um, so I had a, I made a lot of wonderful friends at Trinity and, and at UVM and um, had a great time of being a day hop going to school. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's great. What was your major? I majored in history and minored in um, English. Okay. Yep. Yep. So yep. it was, um, it, it was a, a really great experience. I'm still in touch with a lot of my friends from Trinity. Mm. We get together once or twice a year. Was uh, Maureen McNeil a contemporary of yours? Well, I, I suppose in spirit she was, which is she's younger than I. I'm the same age as Joe. Okay. Although oh, I, okay. I have to, I have to um, correct that and say Joe is at least a month older than I am. <laughs> but they both lived, they lived on North Prospect Street. Our, yes. our, um, their mother grew up across the street from my mother on Maple Street. Oh. And their Nana was a very close friend of my mother's. Okay. And, um, so, and my father and Joe were great friends. So we just, we knew them forever, you know? Yeah, yeah, okay, right. So you got your degree and then, mm -hmm. then what? Well, a cousin of mine got married that summer and her uncle uh, came up for the wedding and he was working for the city of Boston's welfare department. And that was before Massachusetts went to a statewide uh, welfare program and each town and city did their own. So he, he asked me if he knew I was gonna go to Boston. I was starting to look around for jobs and everything. and. Um, he said, why don't you come see me and um, we'll get you a job in the, um, the city's welfare department. So I, I did that and it was, um, I was stationed at an office that, which was in the Grove Hall neighborhood of Dorchester. And it was a, a, a very much a black neighborhood at that time with, um, you know, I had gone through the series of ethnic people uh, going through that and some of the excuse me, some of the homes were just beautiful, with historic houses that mm -hmm. had been cut up to apartments and everything. Mm -hmm. um, but it was just, uh, it was a, a great message for me to, um, a lot of my clients had um, come to Boston almost, and used the same words almost that Europeans came to the United States, you know, the roads were paved with gold. Wow. And um, uh, several of them, uh, you know, were children of sharecroppers in Boston and in, in the, the south. south, and um, they they didn't have they didn't have much. Yeah. And um, trying to get them into an education class or something, their lives were were very very um, impoverished. And um, I had uh, it was it was I felt sort of um, 
condescending sometimes was if if a client needed a, a a living room set or a bed or something, they came to me, a 21 year old, and All I right. had to become a furniture appraiser. And then I had to say, oh, okay. And I, mm. I tell the story of one of my favorite clients, her name was um, Mary. And um, she came in and said uh, she needed a new bed. She had, and uh, so I went to her home and the bed was, was fairly, old and kind of the mattress wasn't as fresh as it could be. So I said, okay, so she went out and found a couple of estimates, but th she was um, bringing in estimates for a double bed. And I mm. knew my supervisor would never okay a double bed mm. for uh. a single woman. Right. And she had four kids and she, she was a terrific lady. But um, so I had to refuse her the, um, uh, the voucher for the uh, single bed. And then all of a sudden, Mary kept coming in for, um, well, she'd come in every day and I was on the fourth floor. I'd have to go downstairs and she would say to me, Ms. Letty, I fell out of bed four times last night. You're going to kill me. And that would go <laughs> on for several weeks. And, um, you know, I would try to explain, I'm so sorry, Mary, I'll be down to see you and see your bed. And, yeah. but anyway, all of a sudden she was coming in for grocery orders, emergency <laughs> grocery orders. And I finally, I finally had to say to her, you got yourself a new bed, didn't you, Mary? <laughs> and, she, and she had. She had, yeah. And she said, I couldn't keep risking my life every night. Oh, interesting. So uh, I worked with her for the next couple of months to pay off the bed so that oh. she wouldn't, you know, she could make her budget work again. Right, but right. It was, um, it was, um, it, it was a very oh. interesting job, especially for a, a, a white young woman from Vermont. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and I, I really admired so many of my clients. They were, mm. they were hard workers and uh, they had resilience that I never yeah. knew. It opened up a whole different world to you from yes, coming it, from it Vermont. Sure did. It did. Yeah, yeah. And I think I, you know, um, I was in Boston when um, Martin Luther King was assassinated mm. and I went to work the next morning and um, the supervisor um, came to all of us Caucasians and said, you need to leave the area now. You're not safe here. And that was, um, I, I remember just walking through the parking lot sobbing because I thought, you know, I, I felt such a loss for um, Martin Luther yeah. King's death. And, but yeah. to think that we were in that place where, you know, he yeah. was killed by a white man and yeah. Yeah. So it was uh, another very telling story. Mm. So it was mm. an interesting time in Boston. Yeah, and you know, I was thinking you were there during the country was in a big turmoil. I mean, yeah. that's not too long. You had the Kennedy assassinations right, right. and all. It was a really tumultuous. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Te terrible times. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So and. You came back to Vermont, obviously. I came back. Tom went to law school, and um, that's your husband. Yes, and um, I was amazed, um, and he did it by attending law school at night because he kept hmm. his job during the day. And um, uh, we started a family. And um, after law school, and it was such a wonderful time that he and I don't know how he ever accomplished it, but. Um, he announced he was going to take the Vermont bar. And I thought, really? I couldn't believe it because he was uh, he was a uh, first generation Irish. Both his parents were from Ireland. And, um, it, you know, he had known that community for a long time and was fond of it and everything. But um, after he came up and he clerked for um, uh, Tom Kenny, who had actually bought my father's law practice. And um, he took the bar and uh, then he opened up his own shop on College Street and um, he did a lot of pro bono work and he did a lot of, um, uh, you know, legal, legal defense work for um, folks that oftentimes, you know, again, he, we always thought he was like my mother, they scratched something on his bushes or something to know that he could probably get some service and a good deal from this guy. So uh. 
Yeah, he, he was big heart. Yeah. 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 Both sides of the family, big hearts. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, he, he was quite something. And um, uh, I have met um, tenants of his that lived upstairs in the office building. Mm -hmm. And um, how, how much they had liked him and admired him, you know? Mm. And he once, um, it, when I was working for Vermont Adult Learning, I, I taught English as a second language for a while. And I worked with a number of Vietnamese uh, folks. And um, this one woman was, she had an extraordinary story, but she was going to, um, she was going to, have to move to South Carolina because her daughter that she lived with got a great opportunity down there. So there's just going to be this one daughter who was finishing school. And um, so I asked Tom if she could, he would rent to her. And, and he said, oh, yes. And so then he'd come home every night. And he, um, she was a fabulous Vietnamese cook. But that sometimes the food that the Vietnamese use can stay be a little bit pungent for a while. Right, right. <laughs> and Tom was like, oh, I love, I love lawn, but I don't know if I can take another cooking <laughs> session. Of course, he, he would eat anything she made for him. She, oh, he, yes, he of course. But, um, <laughs> no, there were, there were some wonderful times there. Oh, that's great. Yeah. How many children do you, did you? Um, we ended up having six children. But I have five daughters and uh, one son. Okay. And he was number five, I think. No, no kidding. No, you think he was number. He was number four. Number four. Yeah. So he had. He had. Uh, he was in the middle of all these girls. And when TJ was running for um, state's attorney, I think the first time, and um, he was had some sort of a house party, and you know he was was trying to sell the public on the fact that because of his sisters, he was so into women's issues. And of course, they were standing right behind him going, what a dope. <laughs> we're not going to buy that one. <laughs> but that's I think it may have worked for some people. But <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, that's a great yeah. story. <laughs> so uh, TJ carried on the political side of, yeah. I mean, and I want to, we'll talk about your years in the House of Representatives, mm -hmm. too. Um, it's yeah. Any of the, did any of your daughters um, get involved in politics? Uh, no, uh, my sister got involved out in Nevada. She became a she was a a, a judge out there, and she um, oh. it was an elected position. Wow. So uh, you know, uh, one of my nephews went out and helped her on that campaign. But um, wow. so far, nobody. Uh, well, Brother Jim was a senator. You know. That's right. Oh, and uh, uh, we served we served together for a while over in Montpelier, which was a you know a really a wonderful opportunity. And he, uh, Jim, and I know Jim well, and he he was he could really he, public speaking was a, a gift that he had for sure. Um, and uh, very impressive senator, very impressive man. Yeah, and um, I I was at UVM last night, and I. I, I um, I wanted to tell the story that um, I was telling people how, what, how much UVM had meant to me over the years. Mm. And, um, and one of the things that I kind of forgot to say but, um, was that uh, both my brother Jim and my son TJ attended speech pathology at UVM. Um, t uh, Jimmy had a stutter and he would go uh, to the speech pathologist. Again, I think it was in Fleming Museum. And then TJ um, would say things like um, Jack. And one of his sisters would interpret, TJ would like his jacket now so he can go out and play. <laughs> and I remember, um, so TJ would go weekly also to this wonderful woman at uh, speech pathology at UVM. And I remember she taught me a wonderful lesson once because I kept on saying, why do you think this happens? Why, why does he do this? And he, she said, we don't ask why, we just fix it. 
Oh, interesting. <laughs> so, you know, kind of telling me to stay out of and stop spinning my wheels because <laughs> things were getting. <laughs> and um, he too is, I think, a, a wonderful public speaker as well. Yes, he is. Um, oh, my goodness. Absolutely. I've heard many of his speeches and yeah. the audience just is riveted. Um, yeah. 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 My father was a great speaker. And mm. um, uh, I think he. Um, he was good in court because of his ability to mm. um, to speak. You know, when he when he was practicing law, right? And um, uh, he had a he read a lot, and he um, I think one of his favorite books was Bartlett's book of quotations. You know, that mm. you could kind of start yes. with something. And yes. it. So, yeah. And my mother was a wonderful kitchen debater. No kidding. Yes, yeah, she could pound the table quite well to make a point. <laughs> to make her point. Yes. And yeah. So, Joey, talk about family a little bit. What does family mean to you? Well, I guess it means just about everything. Um, uh, I was the middle child in my family and classically had an older brother, an older sister, and a younger brother, and a younger sister. Mm. Um, I liked it because I sometimes could get lost in that shuffle of being the mm -hmm. middle child. But, um, you know, I, I think we grew up here in Burlington with a large extended family. We had uh, lots of first cousins that we're very close to. And um, I, I remember one time in high school, Henry's Diner was a great hangout for high school kids. Yeah. Poor Frank Goldstein, he tried everything to get us out of there and he never was successful. <laughs> but I remember more than one night, I was sitting in a booth at Henry's and having some French fries and a Coke or whatever. And all of a sudden I realized, oh my God, I'm with all my cousins again. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but we wow. just enjoyed each other. And we, we had an uncle, um, Father John Mahoney, who was incredibly um, generous to all of us. And mm. he always, there was a party whenever Father John was there. Mm. He used to come in with a case of what he would call belly wash. It was just a case of assorted so sodas, you know. <laughs> and no matter what your mother was saying, he'd say, go get another one. And uh, <laughs> he, um, he watched over us so much and he cared about us. And wow. uh, it was, um, he had been a chaplain with the Vermont Guard in the South Pacific. Mm. And um, the letters that he wrote home were um, uh, incredibly telling. And sometimes when we'd come for dinner at our house, we'd play cards afterwards. And, and the, the game was, I think I, I doubt it. And I, I've been meaning to look up the rules for it because I can't remember. But we would be playing around a hassock, you know, a, a footstool and everything. And I think he, he would tell some stories that would just be tragic of things that happened in the South Pacific, mm. what happened to his Vermont boys. And um, uh, the um, really difficult time that the Japanese gave, he was in a foxhole with another uncle who was the um, doctor with the Vermont guard and two Japanese soldiers ignited themselves and threw their bodies into this foxhole. Oh my and my uncle sort of had to physically pound out the flames. And, you know, those stories have stuck with me forever. Wow, absolutely. And my sister, Ann Sharon, uh, did a terrific job a few years ago by putting together, um, Father John would write to his father and mother, or, and his father was um, the post office, the post Oh, the them? postmaster. Yeah. Yeah. And so he would he would take the letters and have somebody transcribe them and then make copies and send them to all the families. Wow. And so my sister Anne took the box of Father John's letters a few years back and put them together in chronological order oh and gave us all a book. And it oh. was. Uh, it was just fabulous. And um, wow. now my grandchildren are starting to look at those letters and wow. sense of stuff. That's it was wonderful. Amazing. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah, he was uh he was really a hero. Oh, it sounds like it. Yeah. 
And, and he that, promised he promised the Lord that should he bring these Vermonters back, that he build um, a church and name it for St. Jude, who was the uh, patron saint of hopeless cases. Right. And he, he came back and I think it was 46, he got the parish in Heinsburg, built the church and today is still St. Jude's. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. Oh my goodness, I had no idea. Yeah. Wow. And, and another great memory, we, we had a camp and Father John would come out and he would stand in the Lake Champlain for hours on end and let nieces and nephews climb up onto his shoulders oh. to dive over. Wow. And, uh, he, I mean, he, the, he had huge patience. An and incredible he, man, um, wow. A lot. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So you've had a rich family life. Yes, yeah. Yes, yes. Hmm. That's wonderful. And now my children um, are friends with some of their second cousins. Wow. And, uh, yep. And so yep. It, it continues on. It continues on. That's great. Now, at some point, you decided to be to run for office yourself. Yes, I, I, I attribute that to the fact of turning 50. <laughs> and um, I decided whatever opportunity came my way, I was just going to say yes. Mm. And um, so um, it was this district that was really Ward 6 and Ward 5. Yep. And the two incumbents were um, my friends, Karen Lafayette and Mary uh, Sullivan. And they mm. both were leaving. And so they approached me and asked me if I would run. And uh, seeing as I would adopted this um, this attitude of yes to everything. I went, yeah, sure. And um, so it was quite a, it was quite a primary race. Uh, Bill Keough was running. Um, mm. uh, this young Brew, Brew, Nord Brew, his daughter. Oh was, yes. Um, was a lovely young woman and very bright and lots of energy. Mm. And um, I'm trying to think there was, oh, David Zuckerman's wife ran. Wow. And um, so there, I think maybe four or five of us. And uh, so I really, I did a lot of door knocking and a lot of mm. um, calling some cousins maybe to do something. Yes, uh, and yes. Just ran a kind of a classic campaign and, and um, I was very, very happy to, to get elected. Wow. Then when you think of those years that you were in office, um, anything stand out as something you feel good about that you were able to accomplish? I think there's a couple of things. I think first of all was um, <clears throat> Speaker Gay Symington um, appointed me to a um, sort of a citizens committee on um, civil unions and gay marriage. Mm. And um, I was the house member on it and John Campbell was the Senate member. And then there was a, a number of just people, citizens and citizens, business yeah. people. And uh, Phil Hoff was on it as well. Wow. And so we traveled throughout the state of Vermont that summer into the fall. And um, I, I would go to, I, we just listened. We didn't really mm -hmm. interrogate or ask anybody anything. We just mm -hmm. listened. And I took a lot of notes. And um, so the following legislative session, we decided to take gay marriage up and the house had never been so full. It was packed downstairs, upstairs, overflowing. Wow. And we didn't start the debate till probably 9.30 or so. And um, wow. so I was, I was gonna be one of the speakers. And so I, I just struggled with what, how am I gonna present this? And I found my notes. And what I did was I just read what people said. Wow. You know, uh, Betty from Barry yep. said this. Yep. You know, Helen and Joan are afraid of retirement because they yep. can't name their spouse as their, um, mm. their legacy. And, you know, just mm. and kids talking about their two mothers. Mm. It, it was, it was mm. so cool. It was just amazing. Mm. Um, and uh, it was probably the most wonderful, wonderful night of my life and That's i think that was the first time i knew that we were streaming i had a, a neighbor who all of a sudden I, I knew he was down in key west florida and but he he 
emailed oh, me or texted me or somehow whatever we how we ever we communicated back then and um he had listened to me speak wow in west florida wow it, i went oh my god isn't that <laughs> but that was probably the biggest thing the second thing that i did was when i chaired education we went um we um cut down the super supervisory unions and um made them bigger and that yep. was very controversial yeah um, you know like uh north bennington didn't want to be in a district with bennington right and, um, for years um i had friends from bennington who tell me that they still had the the target with my picture in the middle that they were oh my god different public places <laughs> and um so th th that was difficult because um you know, it's funny because when I would talk to people, I'd say, you know, um, Burlington, we have school districts that span different neighborhoods. Yep. And yep. Um, it, it's not a big deal. Right. Uh, and what, what's the big deal of going to school with somebody down the road in Manchester? Yeah. But it, it was a difficult change, but I, I think it's worked out well. And um, I, I feel very happy to have accomplished that. As oh, well. that's great. Yeah, yeah. That that I think that those issues around the school districts lasted for a number of years that, yeah. until it, it's finally worked its way out. Right, yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah. Have you uh, any awards that you've won over the years? Um, I I I have gotten a, a couple of awards. Um, my husband, I I I think you know, had a heart transplant, mm. and. Um, so I went, after we came home from that, I sponsored an anatomical gift uh, legislation. And um, mm. so the, um, I got an award from uh, the, that organization from New York State because wow. of the, we were the first one to, to uh, uh, move that legislation forward and, and make wow. it easier to um, donate and you know to notify your family and whatever that you wanted to be a donor and all that. Yeah. So they gave me an award. And then I was very proud a few years ago uh, in the midst of the pandemic, I got the, uh, I was notified that I was getting the uh, lofty democratic um, uh, trophy of the um, Hoff Curtis. Oh yes. Thing. No. So that, that was absolutely lovely. Oh, that's wonderful. Absolutely. And, uh, it was a, we were all at home and uh, it was on Zoom. <laughs> and I had two young Democratic fellows he, who came over and um, they set up my studio <laughs> with a floor okay. lamp on the dining room table <laughs> and wow. arranged meaningful pictures in the back. Wow. And, um, and fed me notes and um, drank all my beer. <laughs> But it was wow. a great privilege, a great privilege. Absolutely. That's wonderful. Have we missed parts of your life that you'd like to let the audience know about? Well, I, I suppose we have, but I'm not quite, I have some notes here, but um, uh, I think we've covered a lot of it, Gary. Um, um, you? I, I, uh, I don't really, I can't find it. it, it, it well, I have, so, let me ask you this question. So when you think about your life and you think about people who might be listening to it, are there any pieces of wisdom you'd like to share? Things that you've used in your life that help guide you through the ups and downs? Um, well, I think keep on going is one of the things. I, I have not mentioned that, um, uh, Tom had a heart attack when he was 42. And then um, years later, probably six, seven years later, uh, we went to Ireland because uh, my nephew and my daughter were all running the marathon in Dublin. And um, Tom got sick over there and uh, the Irish thought he had a bad cold. <laughs> and of course he was having congestive heart failure. And uh, so we, we flew back and the drive up from Boston and um, he was exhausted, but we, he agreed to go to the hospital the next morning. So he's in the hospital for about a week and um, um, all of a sudden, one of the doctors was a cousin of mine, Chris Terrian, 
asked me for my insurance and talked about some IV medicine or something that he wanted to check out. And in fact, what he was doing was calling Pittsburgh to a fellow cardiologist that he had become friends with and arranging Tom to go down for a heart transplant. Okay, wow. So we, on November 8th of 2000, I think, we flew out of um, Burlington Airport in this little plane. And when the, the hospital from Pittsburgh had set, set it up here to get Tom, and the crew came to the hospital, and I had said to my daughter, Hannah, who was a nurse, why don't you go down with dad? Because he had become very dependent on her knowledge and skills. Mm. And um, so one of the crew said, oh, you can go. We can fit you in. And he said, how much do you weigh? And I lied. So <laughs> I thought. So you could go. Over the Adirondacks. <laughs> but that started a um, quite a significant journey in our family life. Mm. Um, Tom was in ICU for a few days. And th then he was there. And they were actively looking for a heart for him. Mm -hmm. And that was that was difficult for him on an emotional basis to think yeah. someone had to die for him to live. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, but you know, when you when you're faced with those things, everything was doable. You know, mm -hmm. uh, my daughter Hannah was offered a job at the hospital, so she was going to move down there. And another wow. daughter who's out in the West Coast, she was going to come down. And I even put a down payment on an apartment for them. Wow. which was in one of the few flat parts of Pittsburgh. And right. it, was, it was near a library and there was a coffee shop there. So I thought Tom could, he was on a heart pump at this time. Mm. And, um, mm. but he could walk to these places. So I thought this would be ideal. Um, but it turned out that they never moved from there because that Christmas night I flew home because um, to be with the kids and, um, for Christmas and uh, I'd celebrated Christmas Eve with Tom in the hospital. And um, I was uh, getting ready to, to put some gifts out under the tree that I had had, you know, had bought and stashed away. And um, Tom called and uh, it was about 10 o'clock in the morning. And he said, they found a heart, I'm going into surgery. And he was all alone. Wow. And, uh, mm. One of my daughters, um, her dad had, um, had, she knew that he had remarried and um, he was in Pittsburgh, outside of Pittsburgh. So we were able to call him. Mm. He was just, he had been a wonderful friend to us. Mm. Year. But he went and sat with Tom all that day. Wow. Be with him. Wow. And, um, I flew down with a couple of my children and, um, he was in surgery, so we we didn't see him till after that. Wow! And, um, so this I was mean, Christmas Day. It was Christmas Day, and wow. I was I was kind of nervous about it, and yet um, I couldn't believe it when I saw him. He looked better after that surgery than he had, you know, when they put the pump in and everything. Yeah. So he had five wonderful years mm. with that um, heart transplant, and. Um, as I said, you know, they, they don't tell you much about who, who was the donor. Right. And, uh, but I know that um, Tom is very grateful and very sensitive, again, to the mm. fact that, you know, mm. he, he benefited by somebody's death. Yes, absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So that whole notion of keep going is uh, certainly. Yeah. You, you just keep, yeah. You just yep. keep going. Just keep um, going. And, um, you know, I, I've been, just been blessed with so many opportunities and so many friends. And um, uh, it, it's, been, um, it's been a very a rich life that I've had. I, I feel mm. very grateful. Mm. Anything uh, that you would still like to accomplish? Well, you know, I was talking to somebody last night. There was a period of my time where I wanted to learn how to fly. Mm. And um, now I realize I don't think I want to do that anymore. <laughs> I love traveling. I would I would still love to um, uh, go some, to some places that I've not been to. Um, I'd love to go to um, South America, and mm. I'd love to go to some parts of Africa. Mm. And um, 
I have a granddaughter now studying at the University of London, and I'm not sure when she's going to get home. But I had thought of maybe going over there and, and yeah. visiting her, but I haven't yet. I haven't yet been able to figure that out. That's and it's wonderful. becoming so beautiful here. I hate to leave here. <laughs> this is the time of the year. It's yeah. Tough. Yeah. 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 So, well, it's been wonderful interviewing you and spending time with you here. Um, I think we're probably getting close to the end of the interview. Okay. Um, if anything, last words you'd like to say? Well, maybe I'll stop in at your house. You only live three houses down from my, That's, my daughter right here. Exactly. New, Please new do. Lovely, very lovely neighborhood. It's a, a we, I love it. it. I feel very fortunate to have uh, yeah. found a home here. Yeah, and, it's uh, just a great place. And it's terrific, uh, a yeah. great neighbor. Yeah. yeah, she is, she is, she's a big heart. Yep, she sure well, does. Well, this was fun, Gary. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for allowing us to celebrate your life. I And I did not even get a chance to talk about the day that I had to take the bully of the neighborhood on because he was t taking my friend Mary's bike away. Oh my goodness. <laughs> oh God. Please do tell us, finish, tell uh -huh. us the story. Tell us. <laughs> well, no, we're just, we're coming home and Mary, my father broke his collarbone on a bike once. So we were never, ever supposed to go near a bike. And mm. because of that, I almost killed myself whenever I was riding a bike and I see his car come up, you know, oh. go through bushes, cliffs or anything. Wow. But Mary was, I was riding on the back of Mary's bike and this this young man who, um, in hindsight, I recognize what a troubled young fellow he was, you know. Mm -hmm. But he started to try, you know, he was trying to get Mary off the bike and mm. trying to take it and, and just, you know, kind of doing some of his bullying act. Yep. And I finally got up and I just let him have it. <laughs> he was so incredibly stunned. <laughs> he had no response whatsoever. Uh -huh. And I, I often think that over the years, I think he learned to respect me because I did slug him so hard. So Exactly. He stood yeah. up to him. Absolutely. Good for you. Good for you. Game of justice. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thank you. It has gone by very quickly. Yeah, thank you.